So yeah, I remember like six months ago seeing some like comments appear in the Substrate code base about weights, um, but they were just comments and like kind of like to do's. Um, and I was like, I should learn about that, but I didn't in time. And so um, I kind of crammed to put this together. Um, but yeah, hopefully it's useful. So um, where do fees come in? So transaction execution, um, a transaction when you submit it over an RPC, like it goes into the transaction queue, um, and then it does pass some checks that Tomek can tell you more about. Um, but if it passes these checks, then it gets inserted into a block, and then that's where the fee gets computed. So it's going to compute the fees, um, deduct it from the sender's account, and then if that successfully passes, it'll actually dispatch the transaction. Um, so I'll talk about it a little bit later, but there are cases where the transaction just won't even get dispatched to begin with. Um, so this is very different from like gas metering, where it'll just start executing a transaction, um, and it just may run out of gas in the middle of it. Um, in this case, we're going to do the whole fee computation before even dispatching the transaction. Um, so fees have a bunch of different components. There's um, base, length, weight, and an optional tip. Um, and all of these things combine to be an inclusion fee. So these four things are what actually gets computed and deducted before a transaction gets dispatched. Um, and then there's some other stuff that you can do within the function itself um, that I'm gonna talk about at the end. Um, but these four things together constitute the inclusion fee. And so that's what most of this is gonna be on. Um, so the easy ones, a base fee and a length fee. A uh, base fee is just a fixed fee that's applied to everything. And then a length fee, um, you're probably familiar with like the way that a transaction gets encoded. Um, that has a length in bytes, and then you just set like a per byte fee. Um, so those are pretty simple and intuitive. Um, weights is where it gets more fun. So um, the weight fee is based on the resource consumption of a transaction, um, and they represent all of the resource consumption in a single value. So um, this could be like computation, memory use, um, I/O, like how far, and, like how many tree lookups it has to do and stuff. Um, and there are two types of them, that's uh, normal and operational. Um, and so weights should have a couple properties. So one, they should be computable ahead of dispatch. So we don't have any, uh, we don't have any access to like the function logic. We're not in the function yet. We have to be able to compute this before we even dispatch it. They should be lightweight. So this is kind of intuitive. You don't want to have heavy computation in deciding how much fees we should charge for computation. And it's limited to the dispatch logic. So it doesn't know like what the dispatch logic is going to do. And this would be like, you could know when you decide on your weight, you could know that you're going to iterate through some list, but the weight computation function itself doesn't have access to these variables. So it doesn't know how long this list is going to be. And so if you have variable consumption like that, you're going to have to put more fee calculation inside of the dispatchable function. Uh, so blocks, Blocks are limited they, uh, by fullness, so they can be limited by weight and by length. So um, the system palette accumulates all the weights for a block, and it's also adding up like the, all the encoded transaction length. And so in Polkadot, uh, we target 25% fullness, and then 75% uh, is the maximum weight for a block in for the normal operations. And then like the operational ones, um, those can go over up to the maximum. So 25% of the block is always reserved for the operational class. Um, so how does this stuff all get represented? Um, so in your runtime lib.rs, um, it's pretty simple. Uh, maximum block weight, um, available block ratio. So you see we have 75% of the block reserved or available uh, for the normal dispatches. Uh, maximum block length, I just took this from the uh, Kusama runtime, so it's five megabytes. Um, those all go into the system module, and then all this transaction base fee, byte fee, target block fullness, you can see is 25%, um, 10 millicents per byte, um, and then we have this like fee multiplier update and weight to fee stuff that we're gonna talk about. So this all just goes right into your parameters in your runtime. So normal versus operational, uh, normal, Dispatchables are most transactions. Uh, almost anything that a user can call is going to be normal. And then operational, it, these are things that you deem to be high value transactions. Uh, so a fisherman reports, you don't want that to be delayed because 
like the block is full of other transactions. Um, you want that to have kind of reserve space in the block so that it can get executed right away. And then either of these can have uh, zero weight, uh, max weight, or variable. So um, this is just in an enum, uh, simple dispatch info, you can have fixed, max, and free. And so um, this is really like the simplest, this is the simplest um, like implementation that you could possibly do. Um, so you should go to the uh, recipes page. We have some more that you can do with us to do fancier stuff because you can really do like your own custom implementations for like how these get represented. Uh, so how do we convert weights into fees? Um, because they have different types. Um, so like with the with the uh, base fee and the byte fee, that's pretty simple. You can just kind of multiply like the length by balance. Um, but for weights, we have to convert it. You can put really any kind of logic that you want in here, but you just have to implement uh, this convert function for a weight to fee. Um, so in Polkadot, uh, at least right now, it's really simple. It's just, uh, what is this, one tenth of a cent. Uh, you just take the weight and multiply it by that, and you get a balance out. Uh, but when you make your own chain and substrate, you can do really whatever you want with this, um, whatever kind of custom logic, and you can even have multiple ones that um, I'm gonna show a little bit later. Um, so adjusting fees. Demand on blockchain is irregular, and there's a trade-off between um, having rapidly changing fees or long inclusion times. So um, you could imagine like a fee that adjusts very quickly. Um, it's nice because it helps you prioritize transactions, but the problem is, you could have your fee change by like 10% over the course of a mortal extrinsic in like 50 or 100 blocks. Uh, and people might not wanna pay that much, they might prefer to actually wait. Um, so the other option is a long inclusion time. Um, or what we did is we took the long inclusion time and we added this tip. So um, it takes this like base, byte, and weight, and then you have this option of adding a tip. and. In the transaction queue, the priority of transactions is sorted by the sum of all four of these things. So you have, um, if you don't think that your um, slow adjusting fee is going to make it in time, then you can add a tip and that'll move it up in the priority of the transaction queue. Um, so the way that fees get adjusted is it just has a, your current fee um, and then it has a multiplier for the next block. And so this just goes block to block. You can only predict for the next block. Um, so to do a little example, like if you wanted to predict how, how much your fees could change in a transaction, um, we have this uh, struct targeted fee adjustment, and this just converts the current fee multiplier to the next fee multiplier. Um, I left out the actual logic of the function because it's a lot of lines of code that wouldn't fit on here. Uh, but basically we have this, um, you take the previous block weight minus the target weight of the block. So in Polkadot's case, um, the target weight is 25%. Uh, and then you just take the previous weight, whatever that was, subtract the target weight, and then uh, run through this equation. Um, the Web3 researchers picked this uh, V of 0. 0.00004. I'm not sure how they arrived at that conclusion, but there are a few of them floating around. Um, and it just returns the next multiplier. So if we wanted to calculate the fee over like 100 blocks, um, you could just raise this to the 100th power. So um, the maximum a diff could be would be one, and this would be really if you had a target block fullness of zero. Um, but we can just take this uh, equation, get the, the, fee up, uh, the maximum fee multiplier update for the next block, raise it to the hundredth power, and we could find that um, fees could change about 0.4% over 100 blocks, which is really not a lot when you think about like how um, how quickly demand on a blockchain can change if there's like a huge surge in transactions. So we really expect people to be using tips uh, in order to prioritize their transactions. Um, so yeah, tips, they adjust slowly, demand adjusts quickly, um, and they're optional, you don't have to add them. I think in, you can also decide kind of like what to do with this whole transaction fee. So all four of these things um, that constitute the inclusion fee, you can decide like, so in Polkadot's case, we send 20% of the block author and 80% of the treasury, uh, but you can also implement that, like whatever you wanna do with these fees, uh, that's customizable. Um, and so yeah, the dispatchable stuff, so once you get past the fee, um, I kinda mentioned at the beginning, there's other ways to take, uh, there's other ways to take fees or limit resources. So one is like an account creation fee, 
And so in this example, like when you create an account, you're adding another item to your tree. Um, and so just by like adding another item to your database, you're going to make other lookups, uh, other operations slower. And so you might not want to account for this before the transaction because it doesn't have the internal transaction logic. So inside your transaction, you might want to take an extra fee for something like that. Um, other things you can do is like a voting bond. So like when you vote, you have to iterate through this list to see if you've already voted because you don't want to be able to insert the same vote twice um, or insert different votes from the same account. And so the dispatch logic doesn't really know how long that list of voters is going to be. And so you might want to take a deposit um, when somebody votes. And then you can just put like hard coded in bounds. And so like in staking, um, we set like the maximum number of nominations to be 16. And this just limits uh, the size of the list that Fragment has to iterate through when it goes. And so there's a lot of different options you have for limiting resource consumption, and it all depends on exactly what you're trying to do or like what kind of logic you're using or what kind of state that you're operating on. Um, so I think that was it. There was one other thing I wanted to show that I forgot to put in the presentation. Um, I don't know how to use a Mac. Um, to, here we go. Oh wait, how do I change tabs? So this all gets implemented in this uh, transaction payment module. And so some of the stuff I showed you, like there's wait to fee. And so um, F. <laughs> yeah. So you have this like wait to fee of how to convert a wait to a balance and I also don't know how to do control F on here. Here we go. So like in this compute fee function, uh, you just have this weight to fee. And so if you wanted to implement uh, various weight to fees, and so this is a, like in the recipes also, you can see this. Um, you could do like a linear weight to fee or a quadratic weight to fee. You could have different weight to fees for different functions or different modules. Um, and so this is just the simplest implementation where it calls a single weight to fee convert function, but you could really put any kind of custom logic you want depending on which module or function you're using if you want to compute fees based on the same weight in a different way. Um, so it's quite flexible. Um, Substrate right now really has like the most simple implementation of this. And so it's really like, yeah, you have a, a whole palette to explore on and develop your own custom fee structures. So um, I think I can open it to questions now. Um, and if Rui Tao wants to start setting up, because I know he wants to change laptops, uh, we can do that. Yeah, Chris. Hello, Joe. So it might seem like sort of an obvious question, but um, where do the fees go? Who receives the fees? Yeah, that's up to you. Um, so in Polkadot's case, 20% go to the block author and 80% go to the treasury. Um, so uh, I don't remember off the top of my head where that actually gets implemented. But yeah, you can set it, you can set it to firm, you can set it to go to the treasury. You could, uh, I mean, if you build a chain, you could just set it to go to yourself. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Hey. Hi, um, I'm Julio. I'm wondering um, about the treasury that you just mentioned. So 20% to a blog author and 80% to a treasury. That's when a substrate chain becomes like a parachain in Polkadot, right? Could you explain a bit more what is that treasury and what is the purpose and future like vision? Yeah, so, oh, 
I don't have the laptop anymore. Um, but <laughs> um, yeah, so the treasury is, it's sort of DAO-like, and in Polkadot, well, so first of all, it's just a module. Like, there's a palette treasury, and then you can make proposals to this treasury. Um, so uh, actually, on Kusama, someone did this a couple days ago. They just made a proposal to send themselves 100,000 KSM. Uh, I don't think it got approved. But um, yeah, so the treasury is just this, um, it's actually, it's like literally an account on the chain, uh, but in order to spend funds from this tr from this account, you have to um, make a proposal that gets passed via some governance mechanism, which could be um, a council or a democracy or whatever kind of rules you implement in your chain. Uh, but yeah, it's at, at its lowest level, it's just an account, and then you get to decide really, or you have to decide how people decide how to spend funds from this account and under what conditions funds go into this account. Does that make sense? Yeah, another from Adam. Okay, thank you. Hey, um, so I'm just trying to understand, so you have, um, so extrinsics have this weight that you can kind of decorate them with, and then in some cases you also take an additional fee. So I think one of the examples you had is when you're creating a new account, there may be some additional fee associated with that. I'm trying to kind of, I mean, if you're always taking a fee when you're doing that, why wouldn't you just account for that fee in the kind of way to the transaction rather than having separate logic in the actual extrinsic to extract another fee? So I guess I'm trying to understand, what, you know, when do you take a fee as part of the logic in the actual extrinsic versus kind of just decorating the extrinsic with an additional weight. Yeah, so um, we have this concept in the in the dispatchables of um, like verify first and write last that Sean will be happy to tell you more about. But um, so as if if you're familiar with like the existential deposit. Um, actually, one thing I should have mentioned at the beginning uh, in the like transaction queue and exec execution logic is that when you're taking this fee based on weight, it has a keep alive requirement. And so you'll never actually kill an account just based on the fee that's being taken. And so there is a possibility that you take this fee and it would just actually it would, it would just stop execution and not dispatch the function at all. And so you only want to charge this. And then there's also other checks within like a balance transfer where you might say, I'm going to create an account based on this transfer, but you don't actually know if you're going to create an account or not. Um, it could be, you could be transferring to a new account and you're checking within the function, does this account exist yet? And if not, then we need to create it and pay this fee. And if it does, then we don't need to actually pay this fee because the account already exists on chain. We're just updating something that's already there. And so it depends if you want to take it ahead of time or if you want, or if there's like some logic that could lead to this not being taken. Okay, so, so if you always know that you're going to take a fee in a particular extrinsic, you should sort of do it at the top level. If there's some conditional logic, that may, you know, maybe sometimes you take a fee, sometimes you don't, then you have to kind of defer it until later and, and take it. Yeah. yeah, and there's also other logic that could just lead to this say like transfer not even happening at all. Like you could try to send more balance than you even have. And even if it would have created an account, it's just not going to execute this transaction at all. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I was wondering uh, how does the client it best estimate what fees they need to pay. So specifically, I'm, I'm thinking about this tip. Is it always paid or is it just, uh, yeah. Does the client only pay for what they need or do they actually always pay the tip, the full tip? Does that make sense? Yeah, so however you come up with tips is really up to you and will probably evolve as we see how, how transaction demands evolves, um, but yeah, you have to pay the whole tip. It's not like just a minimum. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I just want to confirm that, so now it's possible that uh, the, at first the transaction will uh, in any case include in the block, but before dispatch, it will. It may have some check field and uh, run out of run out of gas or fees, and 
like it won't just go to the dispatch uh, process, right? Yeah, that's okay, correct. Thank you. It should be quite rare because, um, so Sean talked about this signed extension yesterday, and it actually checks this in the transaction queue before including it in a block. So it would have to be like a really like a very like borderline case that something changes between checking the signed extension and actually having this block finalized. So it should be quite rare, but it is possible. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much, Joe. Thank you.